good morning. So, good evening, everybody. This is Brother Dave, the pastor of the Drakesboro United Methodist Church and the Jurgens Chapel United Methodist Church. And I'm here this evening to welcome you to another of our weekly Bible studies. Um, I guess I should start uh, with some prayer. Holy Father, we thank you for bringing us here, for allowing us to spend time in your presence and to learn. We pray that we would learn from you ways that would teach us about Jesus and would teach us about ourselves and we ask Lord Jesus that at the end of our time together we would be different in some respects than we are right now we pray that you will continue to change us as we enter into your presence it's in your holy name that we pray these things amen I know with COVID-19 running rampant that you have many concerns and so I'll take a little time at the end of our study as we thank the Lord for his presence with us and you can name those people that you're concerned about and those concerns that are at the top of your list Again, I thank you for taking the time to study together. Our study this evening is under the heading, Reading Imaginatively. And my prayer is that you would be able to say to yourselves, as you, as you turn to a passage for the first time, and you haven't prepared any remarks to say about it, you just are turning to it, I, I pray that instead of saying, gosh, I need to run to my commentary to find out what this is all about, my prayer is that we would learn to study the passages and these passages that we are spending our time on here would inspire you to study others. And, and instead of running for resource materials, we could say simply, uh, let me read and see what we have here. And let me pray, Lord, teach me to understand your word here. So. Let's begin for, with a word from our textbook, Living by the Book. If we always read scripture in the same way and in the same place, time after time, we run the risk of making it into a routine exercise with little interest or excitement. What a tragedy, especially when we consider that history's greatest works of art and music have been created by people who learned to read the Bible imaginatively. Today's passage is from the Gospel of John, John 2 verses 1 through 11. You probably know the story, but let's try to enter into it using our imagination a little bit. In the, in the context leading up to this first verse of chapter 2, Jesus had been talking with Philip and Nathaniel, and in the last verse of chapter 1 he says, I assure you you will see heaven opened and the angels of God 
ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And then we enter into chapter 2. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding as well. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother told him, They don't have any wine. Jesus replied, What has this concern of yours to do with me, woman? Jesus asked, My hour has not yet come. So verse 4, as he responds to his mother's request or statement, they don't have any wine. What has this concern of yours to do with me, woman? Jesus asked. My hour has not yet come. Do whatever he tells you, his mother told the servants. Now six stone water jars had been set there for Jewish purification. Each contained 20 to 30 gallons. Fill the jars with water, Jesus told them, so they filled them to the brim. Then he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief servant. And they did. When the chief servant tasted the water after it had become wine, he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. He called the groom and told them, or told him, Everyone sets out the fine wine first, then after people have drunk freely, the inferior. But you have kept the fine wine until now. Jesus performed this first sign in Cana of Galilee. He displayed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This ends the reading of John 2, verses 1 through 11. I'd like to go back through and fill in a few details and perhaps they'll help us understand the passage a little bit better. When it says, on the third day, the, uh, the message uh, clears that up for us. Uh, Jesus has been talking to Philip and Nathaniel. He makes this prophetic statement about they will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And then three days later, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mom was there, and Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding as well. And you know how it is to go to a wedding Sometimes you are attending someone else's family reunion and Jesus' mother may have known the couple very well and Jesus and his disciples were invited too. Maybe his mother invited them. Jesus' mother told him, this is verse 2, they don't have any wine. That's all she says. But Jesus could tell she was expecting him to do something right there and right then, and it was something he was not ready to do. I expect that they had this discussion away from the disciples, but some of them heard what was said, and it made it into the Bible. It's that important. He differed with his mother there. It was not in his plan for that wedding. And he tells her, What has this concern of yours to do with me, woman? 
and woman in that passage is not a term of disrespect, but it's a term of honor. So I guess it's something like we would say in a conversation, mother. And Jesus asked, uh, this is the, what he asked was, what has this concern of yours to do with me, mother? And then he, he goes on to say, my hour has not yet come, which means the time of his sacrificial death and exaltation has not yet come. He knows it is coming, but it, it's not yet here, so this miraculous sign is a little out of place and out of time for him. And he tells her this, but in verse 5 she is talking to the servants and she says to them, do whatever he tells you. And it's almost as if his mother did not hear him. It's like she knows he did not anticipate or he, he thinks this is not the time for him to do this, but she also knows they don't have any wine and Jesus can do something about it. So she may agree with him, oh well it's not what you had planned, but it's needful here today. You're the only one here who can change this situation. And so rather than arguing more, she says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. He's going to fix this. She has confidence in him. So this is what Jesus did. Six stone water jars had been set there for Jewish purification. It, it's as if when people were coming in to the banquet, they would wash ceremonially and use this water for uh, purifying their hands and feet as they go in to the wedding feast. And now six stone water jars were there, and each contained 30 uh, gallons, 20 to 30 gallons of water. So we are talking about 180 gallons of wine. Jesus tells the servants, fill the jars with water. And so they filled them to the brim. And then he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief servant. And of course I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. And this chief servant was literally the ruler of the table. So he was the one who was in charge of everything having to do with the feast. Another uh, term could be master of the feast. And another, maybe one that we're more uh, familiar with, is head waiter. So here goes the wine up to the head waiter and then he tastes it and calls the groom over and uh, it, it makes a point of saying in in the narrative that even though the uh, head waiter or the master of the table didn't know anything about where this wine had come from, the servants knew it used to be water only minutes ago. It was water and now it is wine and he calls the groom and tells him everyone sets out the fine wine first and then after people have drunk freely, the inferior, the people have drunk so much they're not tasting the wine anymore. They are just consuming it along with their meal, I'm sure. And the uh, chief or master of the table, the head waiter, is really impressed with the quality of the wine which we'll talk about in a minute. And he says to the groom, you, but you, this is an exceptional 
thing, but you have kept out the fine wine until after people have drunk. You, you kept the fine wine until now and serve it. And this is Jesus' wine. I don't even know at that point if the groom knew. He doesn't say anything about it, or we don't know that he said anything about it. But if you're thinking imaginatively, then he's going to be curious. He'll thank the head waiter, and then he'll try to find out what's happened here. He thought they were out. They were in this crisis, and now there's this really fine wine being served. A hundred and eighty gallons. And the, the story concludes in verse 11, Jesus performed this first sign in Cana of Galilee. Uh, it could also read, Jesus performed this beginning of the signs in Cana of Galilee. He displayed his glory and his disciples believed in him. So we have seven miraculous signs that occur in the Gospel of John and this was the first in John 2 verses 1 through 11. Uh, pardon me for just a moment. So we're learning that as Jesus prayed in John 17, verse 24, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me, because you loved me before the creation of the world. And now this is a, one of the occasions where the disciples can glimpse his glory, that glory that he prayed about at the end of, of the gospel. He displayed his glory, it says, and his disciples believed in him. The first of his miraculous signs. I'll read the account from the message, and you may also find it uh, informative, beginning with verse 1 of the second chapter of John. You can follow along in your Bibles. Three days later, there was a wedding in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. Jesus and his disciples were guests also. When they started running low on wine at the wedding banquet, Jesus' mother told him they're just about out of wine. Jesus said, Is that any of our business, mother? Yours or mine? This isn't my time. Don't push me. She went ahead anyway, telling the servants, Whatever he tells you, do it. Six stoneware water pots were there used by the Jews for the ritual washings. Each held 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus ordered the servants fill the pots with water and they filled them to the brim. Now fill your pitchers and take them to the host, Jesus said. And they did. When the host tasted the water that had become wine, and parenthetically, he didn't know what had just happened, but the servants, of course, knew. He called out to the bridegroom, everybody I know begins with their finest wines, and after the guests have had their fill, brings the cheap stuff, but you've saved the best till now. This act in Cana of Galilee was the first sign Jesus gave, the first glimpse of his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum along with his mother, brothers, and disciples, and stayed there several days. So if, what I'd like you to do now is think back to the last wedding you attended 
of someone who was close to you. Suppose that person and his or her new spouse showed up at their reception to discover that for some reason there were no beverages. There were expensive canapes, small pieces of bread with toppings, and extravagant desserts, but nothing to wash them down with, and all the nearby stores were closed. The newlyweds had no plan B. So think about how you would approach this problem. How do you suppose they would feel, the newlyweds? How would you feel as you saw them in such an embarrassing position on what should be their special day? And uh, of course, on this day that is so special, that failure is one that they will remember and perhaps their guests also will remember. That's the day we had all this lovely food but nothing to drink. Maybe they are all sad, and maybe they are wondering what in the world happened to their drink order. And I imagine that everybody around really is thirsty. And this will, this will scar the memory of their wedding. Do you think everyone would be content to toast them with water? Well, for the couple in the story in the Bible, there may have been no drinkable water around for them to drink. I suppose they could use the water that was there for the ritual purposes, but it had already been uh, used, a lot of it probably used up in the, in the cleansing that the Jews did as they entered into the banquet. So maybe there wasn't any water on that day, but nowadays, usually, we can get to some water, if nothing else. And I think everyone would have been disappointed, but they would have taken it and made the best of that bad situation. And probably they wouldn't have thought any more about it the bride and the mother of the bride certainly would, but probably nobody else would think all that much about it. How do you think Jesus felt when he heard that the newly married couple at Cana was running out of wine for their guests? His mother came to him and, like many mothers, just said, they're running out of wine. And all the rest was implied. Didn't have to be said. It was already implied. Jesus knew what she was thinking. And he said, it's not my hour. This is not the greatest timing for me. I'm not prepared to do this, even though he knows that's what she wants. And because it's what she wants, he will go ahead and provide this miracle for this couple at this feast. So it's a little bit against his will, yet he was willing to allow his mother to influence him. I believe the, the next question, do you feel there is any significance in the fact that this was the first of Jesus' miracles, and if so, why? And I think perhaps this is significant, because this is the first of Jesus' miracles, the first of seven, and Jesus was no more prepared for this than anyone else. He had not intended this to be the first of his miraculous signs, but here it is. Do you get the sense that Jesus was concerned only for the spiritual well-being 
of the couple? What does your response suggest about Jesus' concern for your own current struggles? Was Jesus concerned only for the spiritual well-being of this couple? No, he was not. That was not his only concern. He was also concerned for all their guests and that their day would be a day of celebration without this disappointment that would virtually stop the feast in its tracks. And here we're thinking maybe we've never thought that Jesus cared very much for our ordinary everyday concerns like we're running out of water to drink, we're running out of food to eat. But Jesus is very concerned, as concerned as he was about the couple's happiness and about the guests having all they needed. He provided wine for them, but the wine was not just an average wine. It was a really fine wine that the head waiter noticed right away and spoke to the groom about it. And surely the groom would speak to those servants who were dying to tell somebody. And so they told him. And then he came to Jesus. This is my imagination, of course. There's no record of this. And then he came to Jesus and gave Jesus all kinds of thanksgiving. And perhaps he became one of Jesus' supporters for the ministry, all through the ministry. Maybe even he became one of Jesus' disciples. It never tells us what his name was. So, we have this concern, and Jesus is concerned for our every concern. He truly cares about us and about our situation. Here's a little more from our study guide. If we read this account with little or no imagination, we conclude that Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine. But if we imagine ourselves there, or if we imagine Jesus here among us, we may get a glimpse of an infinite God who is concerned about all of our problems and embarrassments in life. Similar lessons are to be found when we use our imagination as we sail with Noah on that great ark, as we stand in the fiery furnace with Daniel or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as we witness the fall of Jerusalem in the hands of the Romans, destroying everything in sight, as we worship at the manger and we think and remember the birth of Jesus as Mary lays him in a feeding trough all wrapped up with rags or share a plank with Paul after a violent shipwreck Paul's nervousness there and hearing all of the other sailors complaining about what he has brought on them. If your imagination is out of shape, you'll need more practice than most people. But if you're willing to put in a little effort into these exercises, we imagine you will benefit immensely. So keep, keep coming back for future studies. This is our last study at this moment for uh, revving up our imagination. But let me tell you uh, just quickly about those other six miraculous signs. They're all given in the Bible. Uh, many, many times the Bible will provide headings for these 
special things and uh, we find the first sign turning water into wine here in John 2 verses 1 through 11. The second sign is in John 4 46 to 54 where Jesus heals the official's son. The third sign is in John 5 verses 1 through 15 where Jesus heals the man who had been an invalid for 38 years. The fourth sign is in John 6 1 through 14 where Jesus feeds 5,000 people. And the fifth sign is in John 6 15 through 21 where Jesus walks on water. The sixth sign is in John 9, verses 1 through 41. Jesus heals the blind man. The seventh sign is in John 11, verses 1 through 44, where Jesus brings Lazarus back to life. So all seven miraculous signs tell us about our infinite creator, our great creator and Lord and Savior who loves us so deeply, he is willing to provide miracles for us in our healing, in our day-to-day -day lives. I want to find that phrase again so I can have that be the last thing that you hear are one of the last things that you hear this evening. We may get a glimpse of an infinite God who is concerned about all our problems and embarrassments in life. All our problems and embarrassments from this infinite God who loves us without condition. So let's go before him as we pray. Our Father, we thank you for your presence with us this evening, and we ask that we would continue to get glimpses of you, an infinite God who loves us and cares for every concern and embarrassment in life. We thank you for the love and care that you showed to this couple in Cana. We thank you for the way that you brought joy to them and to the impact you made with this first miraculous sign. We thank you for your prayers for us as we continue to struggle through this pandemic. We thank you, Father, and we pray for our friends, our neighbors, all who are in need or in pain. We pray for all those who are suffering with COVID-19. We pray for their healing and that they would be able to resume their lives without any residual pains and hurts or limitations from this disease. We thank you, Lord, for your presence with us and within us. And we ask all of these things in the strong name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. So now, dear friends, go in peace. And may the peace of the Lord be with you and with all whom you love. Good night.